goes on very nicely from what Patricia Ashby has just been saying. And I find the way she presented intonation to you to be absolutely exactly what I would have done. And uh, I hope that we aren't in any disagreement at all. And that you will therefore be able to follow straight on now with what I'm going to do with you, which is precisely working out what is the appropriate intonation for a text. Here's a text of a dialogue. We can't speak a dialogue on a monotone. We're not going to say, hey, oh, you were going to return those books of mine you borrowed, which books I can't remember borrowing any. No, we've got to put an intonation on it. How do we decide what to do? Well, people speaking naturally, of course, do it because they know how to in their native language. They don't know that they know this. It's a big mystery of language. We know how to manipulate the language, though we don't understand what we're doing. What we're doing now is to analyze this, to make clear the principles involved, so that we can work out how to do it from logic. So, really, this is going to be your job. What are the things that we do? Well, Dr. Ashby gave you two steps. I'm going to give you three steps. The first two, though, are the same as her first two steps. And I quite agree with, you, with her. The first thing to do is to, as we say, decide the tonality. That is, you must break the material up, divide it into chunks, into pieces. But you can say the thing a different way. You must locate the intonation breaks. Where are the breaks going to go between the successive pieces? So, there is our first little bit of the dialogue. And I've broken it into pieces for you. It started with an interjection. Now, interjections usually are said as a separate intonation phrase. It's not absolutely compulsory. The speaker has some discretion about this. This is generally true about intonation. The speaker has discretion. There is not just one right answer. There are several possibilities. So what I've chosen to do is not necessarily the only way of doing this, but it's the one that seemed to me to be most natural. And we can discuss if there are other possibilities. And in general, throughout today's session, I do invite you to make your comments, to say if you think something different would be possible or poss uh, could be interesting or better than what I've got here. This is not the last answer. Now, the other thing that I do with longer dialogues is I number each group, each intonation phrase. This makes it easier to refer to them when you have several on the screen. So I can say, OK, number one, we've got just one word. In number two, we've got a, a whole sentence. And then I can discuss, do we need a break between one and two? We don't actually need one. We could put it all into one longer group, but it's better with a break, I think. When B answers, it's clear that we have two groups, two intonation phrases, and the break goes corresponding to the punctuation. Because very often, of course, intonation breaks do correspond to punctuation marks, to commas, to full stops, though not always. Well, that's our first job, divide it into chunks. What's the second job? Do you remember what Dr. Ashby told you was the second job? We have to decide where the nucleus goes. <coughs> well, putting this in more complicated terminology, we have to decide the tonicity. That is, more generally, the accentuation. Which syllables do we accent? And in each intonation phrase, in particular, we have to locate the nucleus, together with any other accents. The nucleus, by definition, is the last accent and the most important accent. Well, where do you think the nucleus is going to go in number one? No choice, only one syllable, must go on that. Where is it going to go in number two? Are you going to return those books of mine you borrowed? Now, this is a difficult dialogue chosen to illustrate problems. 
and we have straight away a kind of exception. This is not for beginners. The problem is that this is one of these constructions in which an object noun phrase has been moved, namely the object of borrowed. You borrowed some books. In English, when we make a WH question out of the object, we move the whole noun phrase to the beginning, and we're left with a gap after borrowed. So the verb is now final. Transitive verb in final position, which is an unnatural place for transitive verb to be. And the intonation, in fact, reflects this. Where does the nucleus go? Any ideas? Not on borrowed. It's going to go on the object, which is books. It goes on the last noun. In fact, we usually teach the rule that the nucleus goes on the last lexical item that adds new information. But there is a sort of rival movement that says, no, the rule you ought to teach is the nucleus goes on the last noun. Because there are sentences like this where that has to be the case. Well, what we're going to say is, are you going to return those books of mine you borrowed? Books is going to get the nucleus. And now in number three, where's the nucleus going to go? This is easy. Which books is given, isn't it? Books is repeated. So the nucleus goes on which? Unless we're Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> and now in number four. I can't remember borrowing any. Well, any is a function word. It's not going to go there. We'll start at the end and work back. Not going to be any. Was it going to be borrowing? No, it's repeated. Remember? Yeah, possibly. The other place it might go is I. I can't remember borrowing any. Or I can't remember borrowing any. With the implication you remember my borrowing those books, but I can't. I don't. So there are my suggestions for the location of the nucleus. Hey, you're going to return those books of mine you borrowed? Which books? I can't remember borrowing any. And of course, I've been helping you with the third stage. What's the third stage? Choosing the tone. Decide each nuclear tone. Is it going to be a four, or a rise, or a four rise? Now, I try where possible to operate in the very simple three-tone system for rise, for rise, which we started with with Dr. Ashby. You can, yes, subdivide them into high fall, low fall, high rise, low rise, and so on, but I prefer, in fact, to leave that a little bit later. So I'm today going to operate just with those three. So what are we going to have? What are we going to do for the interjection, hey, at the beginning? Is it going to be hey? Is it going to be hey? Is it going to be hey? Which do you think? Hey! It's going to be a four, yeah. That's the usual default for attention joy. Inter interjections like this. Now what have we got next? We've got a question. Questions fall into two main groups. Yes, no questions and WH questions. Yes, no questions capable of being answered by yes or no. WH questions which ask you which, who, why, when, where, what a more specific answer. Which is this, it's a yes, no question. The basic rule in intonation is that yes, no questions tend to have a rise. WH questions tend to have a fall. Which is this, it's a yes, no question. So it's going to tend to have a rise. You're going to return those books of mine you borrowed. Now, we've got another question in number three. But this is a WH question. So a WH question is likely to have a, a four. The way I've done number four is, again, rather advanced, rather tricky. 
putting the nucleus on an I for reasons of contrast. The contrast between what the other person remembers and what I remember, implying that we don't agree on what happened. And we're emphasizing the difference between the two of us. You think that, I think this. And to, do, to draw a contrast, one of our favorite tones is a fall rise. So that's, in fact, how I would do this. Hey, are you going to return those books of mine you borrowed? Which books? I can't remember borrowing any. Would you like to try doing it aloud with me now, everybody? Let's take, the, take it uh, phrase by phrase. We start with number one. Just do it after me. Hey. Hey. That's easy. Are you going to return those books of mine you borrowed? Yes, notice I have also indicated an accent on going. That's the part that Patricia's students do in their next term, and we didn't get as far as it. This is the business of heads, pre-heads, and so on, which those of you who've studied intonation will know about. It means that we do have some kind of accentual prominence on going. Are you going to return those? And then we get our rise, drop down to the bottom, so as to come up, box of mine you borrowed. Are you going to return those books of mine you borrowed? Everybody, are you going to return those books of mine you borrowed? Once more, are you going to return those books of mine you borrowed? Which books? Which books? Which books? Which books? Which books? Now, four rise with a long, long tail. What did Dr. Ashby tell you about the tail? Fall on the nucleus and delay the rise. So where's the rise going to come? Well, somewhere at the end, borrowing any, somewhere there. I can't remember borrowing any. 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 I, remember borrowing any. I found that some people find it helpful if the teacher whistles the tune. Because that gives you just the pure movement of the pitch with nothing else. So, hey, are you going to return those books of mine you borrowed? <laughs> <laughs> Which books? <laughs> I can't remember borrowing any. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know if that works or not. Other people like to use a swanny whistle, <laughs> which requires a certain manual dexterity. Let's go on. Now, you think about the next one. The ones about biology and language. Those are those books. Uh, could I keep them a few more days? First of all, what's our first step? Break it into pieces. Chunks. Tonality. Where do the breaks go? What A says? Is this one group or more than one? Which books? Which books? The ones? Well, actually, there's an ambiguity here. Does he mean the ones about biology and the ones about language? <clears throat> From the context, probably not. If you did mean that, then you could say the ones about biology. Oh, and language. But you probably say the ones about biology and the ones about language. No, that's not the meaning here. This means books about both of those topics together. So one group, the ones about biology and language. Next break goes where the punctuation is at full stop. Now, there's a special problem with hesitation noises. Uh, this is a hesitation. This is what Americans write UH. Because if they wrote it like we do, as ER, it would mean ER, and they don't hesitate with ER, they hesitate with R. So we spell the hesitation different in British and American. But the thing to remember about hesitation noises is they stand outside intonation. They don't have an intonation pattern. They're usually on the sort of middle pitch. Uh, we haven't decided whether to go high or low. We haven't made up our mind. So, for intonation markup, like now, we ignore them. Cross it out or put it in brackets or something, but we don't give it any intonation treatment. And the rest of it is all one group. So, we can do our break into groups. 
and I've numbered them again, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I've given it a number so we can just say that intonation phrase eight doesn't have any pattern in it at all. Right, next step, what's the next step? Decide on the place of the nucleus. So, in number five, what's the right place of the nucleus? The rule is to start at the end and to work back. Language, is language new? Yes. So that's the place for the nucleus, lang of language. Number six, now this is again an intonation, sorry, an interjection. And interjections <coughs> tend to have their own intonation. So I've given it a separate group. It's only one syllable, so it must have the nucleus. What about those books? Where does the nucleus go? On books? No, that's repeated. So on those, must go on those. Uh, we discussed. Could I keep them a few more days? Is days new? Yes. So, easy. Nucleus goes at the end. Language, O, those, nothing on earth, days. I've also put in accent marks for each syllable that will get an accent. Those on the nuclear tones, we're going to replace it with an appropriate tone mark, tonetic stress mark if you like, the other ones will remain. So now let's choose our nuclear tones. The ones about biology and, now is it going to be the ones about biology and language? That's a fall, or will it be the ones about biology and language? That's a rise. Or will it be the ones about biology and language? That's a fall rise. Which is most appropriate? The ones about biology and, yes, language. Why? Why do we use a four? Well, a four is the basic tone we use to make a definitive statement. It's the way we make a, a straightforward assertion. So you can regard the four as being the default tone, the unmarked tone, the neutral tone for statements. It's appropriate here. The ones about biology and language. The ones about biology and language. Those of you who know about heads, you'll notice that the head starts on ones, the onset, some people call it. We jump up to a high level there. The ones about biology and language. Now, what are we going to do with our interjection number six? We're going to say, oh. Are we going to say, oh? Are we going to say, oh? A fall is right. Yes, it means I've just noticed, but uh, I'm exclaiming. I'm surprised you don't want to admit what I mean. Exclamations always have a fall. This seems to be an iron rule in English. Exclamations, what a lovely day. What a nice thing to say. Isn't it awful? That's marvellous. Uh, exclamations, ex you know, anything you could write with an exclamation mark tends to have a fall. So, oh, and here again we've got another fall, those books. Yes, those books, oh, those books. Uh, nothing. Now, we've got a question. Is it a yes-no question or a WH question? Yes-no. Yes, you could, no, you could. What's the default pattern for yes, no questions? Rise. So probably it's, could I keep them a few more days? Now, these, I remind you, the, the choice of tone in particular is not the only possibility. You certainly can say WH question for the four. Could I keep them a few more days? That's all right. So, it's most likely to be with a rise, but it could be with a fall. It could be with a fall rise. Could I keep them in a few more days? Tentative, uncertain, or something. Has a special meaning. So, 
There is our, uh, is it too low for you to see? I'm sorry, I didn't realize we wouldn't be able to see the bottom of the screen. There it is with the tone marks shown. Four on language. And then I see if you've missed out the ones on those books, I should have put in a four mark. And I put the rise on days. Apologies for the missing ones. You can put them in yourself. Two fours on O and on those. Of course, PowerPoint is interactive, so we will correct it. your turn, I think, to practice saying that. So let's take it, the first one, number five, the ones about biology and language. Everybody? The ones about biology and language. Oh, those books. Oh, those books. Uh, could I keep them a few more days? Uh, could I keep them a few more days? 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 Remember to drop down so that you can rise. Could I keep them a few more days? Is could I keep them a few more days? Everybody, could I keep them a few more days? Lovely. Well, our first job to divide it into chunks, that's easy. We clearly have only one for Y. How many chunks do we need? How many uh, international phrases for the next bit, but because I need them for my essay. Probably all one, yeah. And the last bit, but you've had them for a month already. One, two, both possible. I've divided the second one into two. You could leave it out. You could say, but you've had them for a month. Or you could add something intensifying it already. Next job, locate the nucleus. No problem with number 10, only one syllable available. Where does the nucleus go in number 11? Easy, isn't it? It's got to go on essay because it's new. Because I need them for my essay. Number 12, Again, easy, it must be on month, because that's new. Already it must go on red. Why? Because I need them for my essay, but you've had them for a month already. Our last job is to choose the tones. Why is the WH question? What's the default pattern for WH questions? Why? Four. Why? 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 It wouldn't be possible to use a rise. Why? <laughs> yes, it, it's rather rude. It sounds recalcitrant, uh, disobedient, <laughs> reluctant to carry out what the other person's wishes might be. So you have to be careful. Um, very often, Intonation patterns other than the default one have these special meanings, which may be specific to English. That's why the safe advice to foreign learners is to follow the default patterns. And then you won't be saying things that you seem to imply and you didn't mean. This is the big problem with intonation in a foreign language. As far as segments are concerned, vowels and consonants, we know we have to make allowances when we're talking with people who are not native speakers of our language. And we're used to that idea. But people don't realize that intonation varies from one language to another. And in particular, that the same pattern can have different meanings in different languages. And this is a big trap, because your interlocutors, the people you're talking to, will assume you mean what you seem to be saying with your choice of intonation. And if that's not what you intended to say, 
to imply, then there's a problem. Uh, well, that's worrying. Okay, so why with a four? A statement again, because I need them for my... So, default pattern for a statement is a four essay. Now, what about the last bit? Here, for the first time, we've got a statement divided into two pieces. So far, we've been considering just one clause at a time, one sentence at a time. Now we've got to start thinking about what happens when we have a combination of two, a dependent and an independent component, a subsidiary and a main component. And in English, the big thing to remember is that the default pattern when you have something preliminary or subordinate, and then something complete and final, is four rise and fall. When you have something that is more or less complete in its own, and then there's an afterthought, the default pattern is fall and then rise. This is a bit difficult because you could see it either way around. And sometimes, you see, it's a matter for the speaker to decide which is the main bit and which is a subordinate bit. And we signal it by the choice of terms. Always the form tells you the main part. Here we have a choice, in fact. We could make the month the main part, but you've had them for a month. And then, already, we probably use another form on the end because this uh, reinforces. When adverbs at the end reinforce, they repeat the form. When adverbs limit, then they have a rise. Then you've had them for a month, I think. I think would limit would, would you know, not be reinforcing it, it be weakening it, and so it has a rise. But when it strengthens it, it has a fall. You've had them for a month already. Alternatively, we treat the already as the main part, and we then use the pattern of a four rise and a fall. But you've had them for a month already. That, I think, is a bit better, because it also, the four rise, draws a contrast. That's one of its main meanings, a contrast between what is and what isn't. You've already had them for a month, contrasting with some shorter period which might be tolerable, but you've had them for a very long period. You've had them for a month. Then we have our four already. And that's what I chose. Why? You tried? Why? 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 And then put another four, because I need them for my essay. Because I need them for my essay. By the way, do people teach the weak form because, meaning because? I recommend it. It's what native speakers say all the time. Because I need them. Because I need them. Because I need them. Because I need them for my essay. It's not obligatory, you can say because I need them, but it's fussy, it's over detailed. Native speakers say because because I need them for my essay. Everybody? Because I need them for my essay. Alright, but you've had them for a month. Do that bit. But you've had them for a month. A month. Down and up again on month. But you've had them for a month. Yes. Those of you who know about heads will notice a falling head on had. I'm not marking it in any special way because we leave that to the later stage. But you've had them for a month already. Or already. Already. Whole thing, but you've had them for a month already. But you've had them for a month already. But you've had them for a month already. Again. Because we've had them for a month already. Lovely. Chunking, tonality. How are we going to break this up? Well, probably we'll have a break at the mark at the same place where the comma is. And another one, of course, where the full stop is. That will probably do, I think. When I remember, I try and use a single mark for 
a break within a sentence and a double mark between sentences. There's actually probably a complete hierarchy of these things. All that matters is the relative importance of them. And, uh, that will do. So I, I don't uh, make a big fuss about the status of the different sizes. And I tend not to put them at the end of an utterance because there it's self-evident. I noticed that Dr. Ashby was very carefully putting them at the end as well, which perhaps is good. Okay, 14, 15, 16, 17. Where are we going to put the nucleus now in each of these? Well, again, remember the rule. Start at the end, work back. Monday. Is Monday new? Yeah. yeah. So the nucleus goes on month. Back. Have the back. Is back new? Yes. Now, this is a word that might cause you to hesitate because you might think, well, it's sort of a grammatical or function word. However, when we have phrasal verbs, like have back, we have to distinguish between those where the Article, the second element, is a preposition, which tends not to be accepted, and those where it's an adverb, which tends to be accepted. And this one is an adverb and gets accepted. So we say to have something back. So back is the right place for the English. Right, number 16. How many, how many syllables here? Two. So we've got a choice. Do we put the nucleus on the O or on the K? K. 17? Now. Nucleus on so, or on suppose, or on I? So is a word that doesn't give any new information at all. It actually means yes. I suppose yes. Or I suppose it's true. I suppose that's right. It's just a dummy, a filler. It doesn't have much meaning. It's typically unaccented. So the nucleus goes on pose. I suppose so. So here's my idea for the accents. Just give me until Monday and then you can have them back. Okay. I suppose so. And our third job is to fill in the tones. All right, what are we going to do on Monday? Well, this is a good example of anything is acceptable. You could do it with a form. Just give me till Monday, then you can have them back. You could do it with a rise. Just give me till Monday, and then you can have them back. You could do it with a four rise. Just give me until Monday, and then you can have them back. So, I think you should be pleased that there are many cases where this is the case. Teachers sometimes come to me, or learners, and they're worried. They say, we must have a rule. We know we must be told which one is right. And all I can say here is that all three are right. And uh, it doesn't make a great deal of difference which one you use in this case. When we come to back, however, number 15, now here, this is a firm statement, so it needs what tone? A fall. So something or other on Monday in 14, then a fall in 15. 16, this is a form of yes no question. And this must have what? A rise. Okay? 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 We come back with a statement. So, what I'm suggesting is a, a fall on Monday, and I said the others are possible. Another fall on back, rise on K, fall rise, well, I suppose so. Aha, that's not what I said. I suppose so. What's the difference in meaning between I suppose so? I suppose so means, okay, yes, that's what I'll do. But I suppose so has an implication. Four rises give you added implications. Four rises are very important in conversation. Four rises mean I mean something, but I'm not saying it explicitly. A four rise means but something else. I suppose so. I suppose you can do it to me on Monday. But I'd really like it back tomorrow. 
or but I won't be satisfied, or but I won't be pleased, or but I think you're behaving very badly. So a full rise gives this extra meaning and is perhaps the best way to do it. Imitate me then, just give me till Monday. Just give me until Monday. Everybody, just give me until Monday. And then you can have them back. Then you can have them back. Okay. Okay. I suppose so. I suppose so. I suppose so. I suppose so. There is our whole dialogue then. And there it is after the second stage when it's broken up into chunks and with the nucleus marks. And there it is after our third stage with the tone. I think if you approach this general problem in this three-stage way, break it into pieces, deal with each piece at a time, in each piece locate the nucleus, start at the end and work back until you find something new, and something that's lexical, and then finally choose the appropriate tone. So in the new book that I've written that will, I hope, appear next year, after an introductory chapter, I've got separate chapters about each of these topics, about the tone, about the place of the nucleus, and about breaking it into pieces. And then at the end of the chapter, putting it all together in some practice dialogues. But I think thinking about things logically in this way does make it easier uh, to come up with the right answer. You see, the textbooks we have at present, the practice books like O'Connor and Arnold, marvelous stuff, but it doesn't approach it from this end. It just gives you models that you have to imitate parrot fashion. And I'd like to engage the learner's intellectual powers to understand what is going on and why we choose particular patterns in particular places. I ask you, do you agree? So you say, well, I suppose so. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>
always understand, perfectly understand each other? Indeed. No, of course we don't. This is something that's very interesting. And to, as far as I know, there hasn't been much investigation of how far we do or don't understand one another. Anybody who attempts to transcribe material from real life intonation very quickly comes up against the problem that transcribers don't agree exactly what's happening. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to tell where the nucleus is. That's, on the whole, not too hard. It's certainly difficult to determine how many groups there are, whether an accented syllable is a nucleus or just an, a, an accent at the head or somewhere. Strangely enough, it's quite often difficult to decide whether you have a fall, a rise, or a fall rise. In rapid speech, when you know, the way Dr. Ashby demonstrated them, we had these enormous movements with a fall and a rise and a full rise. <laughs> well, all right, but real life isn't like that. In real life, you go, oh, 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 and there's not much movement. And in genuine speech, there's sometimes just not enough movement to determine, particularly between a full rise and a, and a fall. You can't hear whether you're going up again or not at the end. No. A fall, no, is a fall rise in this. The speaker may know which, but the hearer can't hear. In fact, the key to all of this is to access the speaker's intention. And there's no way of doing that objectively except by asking the speaker. We can, as transcribers, try and transcribe what we perceive, and that's maybe a good way of, yes, saying what the hearer can pick up from it, but we can only check that against the speaker's intention if the speaker tells us what he intended, and they don't. So this is a very difficult problem to approach in order to give a good answer to the question you correctly asked. Thank you Any other questions? Professor Wells is the director of the UCL Summer Course in English Phonetics. So, if you are motivated enough to learn more about English phonetics, let's let, please go <laughs> attend the summer course in English phonetics. It's held every summer, usually in, in, in August. This summer I've got a picture of it. Skip 2006. <laughs> will be held. At UCL, Seventy about Chinese characters. Definitely, August Yes, please, search for a website and please apply. Yes, please um, book early. <laughs> yes, you'll get a discount if you book early. <laughs> I recommend that you book. I should say spring. that uh, Dr. Patricia Ashby directs a special stream yes. within this directed at the International Phonetic Association certificate examination, which a small subset of the people take. Most people take the general EFL-oriented course, but uh, there is that as well. And uh, Michael Ashby and Patricia Ashby and I all teach on some course together with many other phoneticians. <laughs> <laughs>